Hello, my name is Marcus Brandt. I'm the head of Mission of International Idea for Myanmar. And uh, we are supporting building federal democracy in Myanmar. Uh, and uh, we have a series of uh, conversations with people from Myanmar and other countries about the current situation. And today I have the pleasure to speak with uh, Dr. Lalita Hamwong, uh, who teaches history at Kasetsat University and is also an advisor to the Thai Parliamentary Committee on National Security and Border Affairs, and is one of the renowned experts on Myanmar uh, in Thailand, and quite known as uh, one of the specialists following the situation for many years, uh, but also advising on the current Thai policy. Lalita, I would like to ask you personally, first of all, how did you as a Thai person get interested in, uh, in Myanmar issues and what made you so passionate? You even learned the language. Um, I've been studying it for many years. What is it for you that connects you with the country? Um, it started when, it, when I was about 19 years old. Uh, I was in my uh, third year at the university uh, as an undergrad at Chulalongkorn University. Um, I was studying history at the time and I went to different classes with uh, many great professors, one of whom uh, is uh, Professor Sunet Chutintaranon, who has always been known across Thailand as one of the greatest experts on um, uh, pre-colonial Myanmar, let's put it that way. Um, and at the time, um, there was a series of films that people in Myanmar know, uh, and that's uh, King Naresuan, and previously, I believe, uh, Queen Suryotai and I, I got really hooked uh, at the time I was still pretty young I was uh, dynamic and I asked myself a lot of questions about um, the history of Myanmar and I came to my conclusion that um, I really wanted to study more about Myanmar uh, I was inspired very much by Ajahn Sunet at the time um, so when he <clears throat> organized a tour uh, to to Myanmar, I I would say in 2004, 2005, um, I went along with him. And I, I got really um, obsessed about the country ever since. Um, so my idea at the time was <clears throat> I already fell in love with the country. I came back with a, a lot of, uh, you know, ideas in, in my brain and in my heart. So I started learning Burmese uh, at Chulalongkorn University with uh, Dr. Tan Tan Min, um, who's still teaching now, I believe. And um, at the time, it was almost the time for me to think about pursuing my master's degree. Um, so with the support of my <clears throat> parents, they, they, decided, they decided to say that, hey, uh, daughter, would you like to go abroad to, to pursue your master's degree? And um, initially, I wanted to go to I wanted to go to the states. Um, my first choice was Northern Illinois University because um, they're, they're very famous for Myanmar studies. Okay, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, I was a very poor student in maths and sciences, and because the the regulation at the time required me to um, to submit the GRE score which I failed over and over again. So I didn't go uh, to the States mm. um, in the end. Now, my mother would um, give me so much comfort. And she said, um, you know, if you don't have a chance of going to America, why don't you just consider going to London? Uh, because I, I was already talking about London to her um, for quite a while. But then, uh, because I was so disappointed not to go to the States, um, I told my mother, you know, I would give up and I would just do something else. But eventually, um, mm -hmm. I was encouraged to go to London and I submitted my uh, application to SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And <clears throat> I just got it. At the time, uh, I had no idea what I would write uh, from, my, from my master's thesis. But I was fortunate to meet my future supervisor, uh, Professor Ian Brown, who was actually an expert on Thai history, um, you know, 19th century Thai history. And I got very close to him. Uh, I, considered, I, I like him and I consider him as, as my father too. 
Um, and then I was, for my master's, I didn't have so much knowledge on Myanmar yet. Um, I decided to write um, a master's thesis on uh, a historiography, a 19th century historiography uh, on the Thai side that was written on Myanmar by Prince Damrong Rajanupap. <clears throat> it was good, um, but then when I returned to London, because I was, I was close to my supervisor and he was fully uh, supportive of me to return to London, uh, so I asked him, uh, this time I don't want to do anything about Thailand because I felt like I needed to be more challenged and motivated mm. by something else. Um, so he suggested I went to the British Library, uh, yeah, the British Library, the Asian and African collection to have a look of what I uh, found most interesting. <laughs> and I spent so many days afterwards um, sitting from 10 until 5 um, just to browse through catalogues at the, um, the Indian office at the British Library. And I, I had a few options. Uh, one was Buddhism in Myanmar, uh, in colonial Myanmar. Uh, but then my supervisor said that, oh, you know, someone uh, is already doing it and I know her very well. Um, so I didn't do anything about Buddhism in Myanmar. I, I concluded my quest at the British Library at the time uh, with a title uh, like the police in colonial Burma or Myanmar. You mentioned the uh, border areas. Uh, and the emerging federal entities on the other side of the border. Mm. And one of those very close here to Mehong Son is Kareni State, which uh, has, of course, had a long uh, historical relationship with Mehong Son province uh, and has in recent years and months emerged as one of the leading actors in the not just resistance movement, now controlling about 80, 90 percent of its territory, but also in the discourse about building a federal democracy. Uh, participating in the national unity institutions, but also having built its own interim executive uh, council and emerging state structures and providing local government services uh, to many of uh, its population. Mm -hmm. What would you say are the specific challenges and opportunities for Kareni state in, with regard to Thailand, both reaching out to the government institutions, the official side, but also the general public? Um, the general public, um, I would have to admit that the Thai society still sees Karini state as some, as a very new state. I know it's not new, um, but mm. there are times when people confu are, are confused of Karini state or Karen state. Um, and, you know, we, we had examples before where the media was confused of which one is Karini state, <laughs> which one is Karen state. Um, so it, it shows that the society is still uh, pretty naive about, um, you know, different actors um, along the Thai Myanmar border. And because Karini state is so much smaller than other states, um, including the Shan state and uh, Karen state by the Thai border, um, I think that that's uh, part of the reasons why um, the Thai government or the Thai uh, public um, still don't realize the importance and potential of, uh, of current state, even if it's on the other side uh, of, of Mae Hong Son. And uh, as far as I know, in terms of culture, in terms of food, um, there are lots of similarities and connections between the two sides. Now, what would you say should current state do in order to reach out to the Thai public or to the Thai government? What is there anything that can be done or on the other side, what could Thailand do to specifically learn more about or, or support Kareni state in building its structures? I would say that um, the executive body of uh, the Kareni um, political body um, would need to approach uh, maybe the Thai media um, that is interested um, and quite engaged about the Myanmar cause. Yeah. We have examples of uh, the reporters. We have uh, lots of reports from PPTV uh, and some other media outlets. I think it's a great opportunity for them to introduce themselves. And I think that one-to-one -one discussions with local authorities, um, regardless of where they come from, um, I would say uh, government agencies uh, here in Mehong Son or um, the Chamber of Commerce in Mae Hong Son and some individuals, business people 
um, I think it would um, give them so much benefit and leverage uh, in, in the near future. And how do you yourself see the prospects for Karenia state within the federal union of Myanmar at, that is emerging? Uh, I think that Karenia state is, is compact. Well, not just because of the size, um, but the executive body is very active in implementing their own um, constitution. And uh, they, have, they have been known to um, the, in, the international community already. Um, I think that they just need a little bit more push um, to make the world realize that they have actually advanced. Um, and they, they mean well, they really mean it, what, what they are trying to do. I think that the team uh, from the Karini side, um, they're very solid. Um, and as far as I know, um, there's, a, there's a lot of younger generation, uh, young people uh, who are working um, to pursue uh, the cause of um, freedom. Yeah, and I think it's a very, very good sign. Mm. So like Karini state, also the rest of the country probably needs to think of how can it reassure Thailand's government, Thailand's general public yeah. that uh, the transformation, the changes that Myanmar is going through yeah. is not a source of worries, a source of new problems, but will actually bring new stability, new opportunities, economic potential maybe. What do you think are the signals that Myanmar should be sending to Thailand for Thailand to be more reassured and to be more open to change? In a nutshell, Thailand is a conservative society. Yeah, it's not very easy to change. Um, but I'm 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 positive here that Thailand is is changing a little bit in terms of um, their mindset and their approach on Myanmar. Because what well, I would say since um, since the uh, violence in Northern Shan State since the Miawadi incident, um, Thai state has learned quite a lot about um, the possibility of uh, ethnic groups of being very vocal about their cause and they can really do it. They can push, um, you know, um, SAC out of their territory. And I think that with this, over time, um, Thailand really wants to change. But uh, again, I, I'd like to emphasize that it's not easy to change the mindset of the Thai government, but um, there must be um, a process of change. There must be some people who insist on, uh, on changing um, ideas that uh, Thailand has on Myanmar. And I think it's a great opportunity now for, for the Karini state, uh, Karini people and their leaders uh, to make themselves known. Because at the end of the day, um, Thailand is home to so many you know, millions of uh, people coming from Myanmar, including Karini state. And uh, a lot of things that take place here in Thailand would shape the, the future of, of the of the federalism in, in Myanmar. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to be patriotic here, um, but at the end of the day, uh, Thailand would always play such an important role. If the Karini executive body uh, has a good relationship with local agency, if they make themselves known um, enough to um, the Thai government, different agencies uh, from the Thai government side, mm. um, I think that things would be a lot easier uh, and more flexible for them in the long run. As a historian, you have studied the colonial history and legacies uh, in Burma, Myanmar for many years mm -hmm. uh, and you have been become f very familiar with the police, the colonial police obviously having studied uh, the various police files. What would you say are the specific colonial legacies that still linger on, that still live on in, in the current Myanmar context? Well, well of course the answer has to be this ethnic um, conflict. Um, I think that leaders from all ethnic sides, um, you have to come together and, you know, just to be clear what you want uh, for your federal future. Yeah. And of course, there will be conflicts. Yeah. Within the same ethnic group, um, there are always conflicts. But I think, um, as someone noted uh, quite recently to me, that the country comes first. Mm. Personal or ethnic interests should come later. Mm. Uh, and I think that this is the way to go if you really want to achieve uh, federal Myanmar. Do you think that the colonial legacy of the British uh, Empire has 
worsened inter-ethnic relations uh, or has sort of laid the foundation for some of the conflicts that have been going on later? And what about the, the way in which the British colonial history sort of left institutions like the police, like the prison service, like the, the attitude of, you know, economic extraction of the country. Are there some things that you see that exist in Myanmar that Thailand does not have because it was not a colony? Um, I would say that the, the definition, very clear definition of, uh, you know, this, this person comes from this race and that person comes from um, another ethnic group. Yeah, um, that's, that's exactly what the British were, were, were very keen on. And that's how, um, you know, there were so many books that, was, that were written on the loyal Karens of Myanmar, you know, the Shans of the hills and things like that, you know. So um, the British uh, were very good at branding um, these groups of people. Mm. So when Myanmar got independence, you know, when, when the Myanmar, when the Burmese government came into power, they, they had to solve this problem. How, how would they uh, reunite the country? Uh, you know, the people from this hill uh, was branded uh, something and the people on the other side of that hill was someone <clears throat> else, you know. So um, the, um, the new Myanmar government in 1948, they had to reconcile this idea. But I think that the time was too short for them and once they started to do it, um, you know, they went around the world to, uh, you know, to make the world known that Myanmar is a great country. Uh, Burma at the time uh, is a great country uh, with lots of cultural um, diversity, but it wasn't successful. And mm. before, before they knew it, there was a coup, this, mm. uh, this historic coup mm. in 1962. And then when the military dictatorship came into power, um, there was no way that Myanmar people uh, could solve this problem ever again, mm. you know? So I think that the, the, the more sustainable way of, of me seeing this is, uh, well, I, I don't know when, to be honest with you, but once SAC has stepped down, um, peoples of Myanmar have to come together and think about their own future, you know? Just don't wait until something happens. Mm. Um, just think very concretely and very strategically of what you want to be or what you want to do. And I think that what uh, Myanmar lacks, especially uh, the leadership, um, is compromise, you know. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, every conflict needs an end. Every war needs an end, yeah. Um, but we don't really see the end to this conflict in Myanmar mm. just yet because um, everybody has their own vision, everybody has their own dream mm. and their own ego. Um, but why don't we come together mm. and just think about our own people, uh, regardless of race, regardless mm. of ethnicity, mm. everybody um, is now suffering. Mm. So why don't we look into the future um, mm. in a more sustainable way, in a more practical way, mm. um, that this war has to end right mm. now. And then, um, you know, the people would not live happily ever after but things would get better. Mm. If we look more specifically at the relationship between Thailand and mm. Myanmar, the relationship goes back many centuries mm. uh, in history. Yeah. And this shared and common history is also something that divides the countries to some extent. Yes. And there is a lot of maybe misconception, misinterpretation yeah. over the years. How do you see the current situation playing out in the context of that historical relationship? And what in what way do the, does the history of democracy in both countries relate to each other? When I was growing up, um, mm. I, I knew that Thai people at the time, uh, they didn't really have good impression on Myanmar or Myanmar people whatsoever. But um, the society here in Thailand has been growing immensely during the last 20 years, I would say. So um, the bitter history, all these historical wounds between the two countries um, in terms of warfare between two monarchies, um, two groups of people, kings, um, it kind of faded in, in my opinion, but it doesn't mean that it, it has completely disappeared. Um, I think that in, in the last 10 years or so, um, the Thai society, the Thai public at large um, has been pretty enthusiastic about learning more about Myanmar. Uh, not because of not because of the 
colonial history, not because of the history of warfare between the two countries, uh, but because of the struggle of uh, of uh, many different groups of ethnic peoples in Myanmar, including the Burmese themselves. Uh, um, and I think that the, the <clears throat> perception of, of Myanmar um, as you know, a political entity um, as a resistance, yeah, uh, grew even more after the the coup of 2021, where um, Thai people, especially younger generations, they could relate um, the event in in Myanmar with uh, so many coups in in Thailand before that. And what would you say is the we are meeting here in Mehong Son today, mm. uh, which has very close historical relationships yeah. with the border regions. Mm. What is the specific relationship across the border with Shan State, with Kareni State, with the Karen, the long, I think, 2,600 kilometer border that is essentially shared not with the Bamar heartland, but right. with the ethnic areas that have been fighting more for autonomy, for independence even. How does that play into, or how is that seen from the Thai perspective? Is that seen as an opportunity, as a threat, or is that something that people are not aware of? I, I think that the Thai public in general um, doesn't have so much idea on, on the border. Uh, I myself, mm. I, I was a historian and I worked mostly in, in Bangkok. But when I got to be um, intrigued and interested about border affairs, um, that was when I, I started to, re to realize that borders uh, in, in Thailand um, are something very, very complicated. And knowledge that people here have about Myanmar, um, that soldiers, policemen, they have uh, about Myanmar, um, are I, I would say that it's, it's vastly different from the perception of uh, Bangkok people. For example, here, um, as, you, as you suggested before, um, Thailand, with the increasing uh, resistance and the idea of federalism and whatever you want to call it, um, you know, who, you, you never know. Maybe at some point, Thailand won't have any um, territory shared with Myanmar anymore, with Burma anymore. Um, there might be some territories shared with the Karens, with the Karenese, with the Shans and some other ethnic groups. And this is what I, I try to convince um, the people I work with, the Thai government and the Thai parliament uh, quite a lot, um, that you know when you see the situation now in Myanmar, you have to understand that uh, Thailand doesn't really have so much contact with the Burma, the Burmese heartland anymore. It's rather um, the border that matters to us. And it's, it's the border that we have to secure and to allow you know, trade, um, to allow people uh, on both sides to have um, you know, more comfortable life. You talk a lot with people from Myanmar mm. in different countries, also in Thailand. Mm. What do you think are the specific expectations that Myanmar people of all different ethnicities have from Thailand? And how do they look at the recent sort of Thai government policy, but also at the general attitudes from the general public? Um, I would say that the general public in Thailand now has matured over the years with, uh, with this crisis in Myanmar. Um, I have been talking to a lot of people coming from Myanmar, what they expect from, from Thailand. I don't think they expect so much. I, I think that they just expect uh, Thailand to be more flexible uh, in terms of immigration rules, in terms of uh, refugees. Well, Thailand doesn't even use this word refugee because they didn't sign the refugee convention. Um, but I think that the Thai, the Thai state the Thai government, especially people who work along the border, uh, like people here in Mehong Son, they understand very well that they have to be uh, up to date. Uh, they have to be more flexible about accepting, uh, receiving more uh, Myanmar citizens coming into the country because at the end of the day, Thailand just cannot push them away, uh, back to the war, uh, back to um, the war zone. Yeah, so I think that Thailand uh, has been growing as the, the crisis in Myanmar has increased, mm. I, I would say. Um, I'm not trying to be too positive here. There, there are always, uh, you know, weaknesses um, that the Thai government has. But because I work with them, because I talk to uh, government officials um, quite a lot, I know that, or well, I wouldn't say there is a 
paradigm shift right now, but it's gradually changing. And there are always ideas of incorporating Myanmar citizens into Thai economy formally, um, rather than pushing them away or sending them to third countries. Mm. Uh, so it's a very interesting time for me and, and mm. for Myanmar people living in Thailand now. You have been following events in Myanmar for many years, 20 mm. years, you said. Uh, how do you think, how do you feel Myanmar has changed in the last three years since the military coup and since the beginning of the spring revolution? What do you see in particular among the young generation that was shaped by this decade of opening? Mm. In what way has, have, has things changed? and is Thailand aware of this of this transformation that has been going on in Thailand in Myanmar? Um, I think that the Thai media has played um, a leading role in this, um, and the Thai media has portrayed um, Myanmar and the resistance groups from Myanmar as as being very active. And sometimes, uh, when we say about political change in Thailand and the role of young, younger generations in Thai politics, we often refer to young people from Myanmar. You know, they lost their lives, they went to the streets, they protested so much um, about the, uh, the, this junta. And um, the fact that lots of young people, they um, dedicate themselves to the cause of democracy. Um, so I, I think it's, it's very comparative here. But um, at the end of the day, as I said before, um, the Thai, both the Thai government and the Thai public are learning so much um, from, from the changing landscape of, of, of Myanmar politics during the last three years um, after the coup in 2021. And what would you like the Thai general public to do more to support these changes, uh, especially in terms of the transformation to democracy but also to inclusiveness and uh, less discrimination. Do you think there is something special that Thai people, the general public, institutions like academia could do more to help? Um, I would say <clears throat> that the Thai public in general is quite tolerant to a certain level, but I wouldn't say that there are 100% tolerant to um, the influx of uh, Myanmar migrants coming into the country. Uh, for example, if you read through some Facebook posts on the possibility of millions of uh, Myanmar citizens coming here, Myanmar workers, um, there are some alarming um, comments on Facebook and other so social media platforms like, oh, we don't want them. Uh, we still want to protect um, labor rights of, of Thai citizens rather than um, Myanmar citizens. Um, so I, I would say that um, there are still some restrictions um, but as I mentioned earlier, that um, the Thai government is trying to do something about it because uh, they are well aware that they don't want to push um, Myanmar people um, away to other countries now because Thailand is changing very fast in terms of, um, you know, we are entering fully um, entering the aging society. So in the next five years, 10 years, we will have more elderly people um, rather than uh, workers or working ages. Yeah? So um, it's very important that we, I, I, I don't want to say import workers from abroad, but I think that what we have now, we <clears throat> have six million, well, some would say five, six, some would say almost seven million uh, Myanmar workers in Thailand um, of all sorts. Um, so how would Thailand incorporate them, integrate them into the Thai society? Um, and to make them valuable um, assets to our country rather than uh, pushing them away or making them um, foreign objects. As a historian, turning your gaze forward, looking into the next 50 years of history, could I ask you, so what is your wish? What would you like to see? How do you like to see the Thailand-Myanmar relationship develop in the next 50 years? Just a big picture, uh, big sort of thrust forward? I, I like uh, Myanmar people who are now in Thailand to have good life. I don't want them to hide. I don't want them to uh, have to bribe, you know, state agencies to have good life and risk-free life. Yeah. Um, and I think that people who are ready to go back to Myanmar can go back to Myanmar and have uh, comfortable lives too. 
um, and I think that this this country on the other side of this um, this mountain here, um, the conflict has been going on for too long, and the country has so much um, to offer to the world, but because of the war, because of this ongoing conflict, um, it cannot present itself to the world. Mm. It cannot offer its beauty mm. and its uh, its uh, cultural richness mm. and others. To the world but and I, I think it's now time <clears throat> yeah and hopefully Thailand will also benefit from having a, a, a neighbor at peace and uh, one that is at peace with itself and the rest of the world yes and Thailand must facilitate that okay thank you very much Laita, for the conversation and thank you very much for watching we will put some links uh, to Professor Ham Wong's uh, uh, YouTube channel and various publications uh, and we hope that you will uh, follow her also on, on her social media. She's very uh, often in Thailand uh, in, on television and in, in the media. And uh, we hope that this was useful for you as well. Thank you.